You know, even after all this time, it's so great to know that I will still forget to unmute myself. That's a good start to an any event. In any case, welcome. We're hopefully starting to see people filter in. For those of you who haven't seen my mug before, my name's Pambe Bahia, and I am a neuroscientist in Tampa, and I am also um, the director for National Taste of Science Festival. Um, how is everybody doing? We have an open chat, so please feel free to get to know each other. Say howdy to us. Where are you? What you up to? Um, so, for the newbies among you, if you haven't been to any Taste of Science events before, we are a science festival for grown-ups because why should kids have all the fun? Um, now we have almost two full weeks of super cool events for you to tune into. Um, so make sure you keep checking back as we update our lists. So a couple of things before we get started, please know as we put in the description of our event, there will be strong language and adult themes during the event tonight. So don't say we didn't warn you. Um, seriously, though, there will be conversations about sex that make people feel uncomfortable. We are not very good at talk about it as a society. So if this is not your gig, we will not be offended if you peace out right now. But we love hearing from you. So as I mentioned, we've got an open chat box. Chat, so please feel free to communicate. Um, if you're on Zoom, though, please leave any questions for us in the Q&A box. Um, if they don't go there, then chances are I'm going to miss them. So, But if you're on Facebook, please leave them in the chat box there. And one of our helpful volunteers is going to transfer them across for me. OK. Why am I telling you all of this? Because our events are an opportunity to get those weird shower thought questions answered by the people doing the work. And now, finally, I want to point out that while we love audience interaction, please be kind. Some of tonight's themes are very sensitive, so while we welcome discussion, we won't tolerate personal attacks or hateful language. We have folks monitoring both those chats, so if you don't adhere, um, please know that you may well be removed. Without, with all of that out of the way, let's get on with the show. Um, so, Andrea, can you make yourself known? I have unmuted myself. I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> that feels like a very yeah, unfortunate term <laughs> to you, given the, the current subject matter. How are you doing, Andrea? Hello, I know the puns um, are likely to abound tonight. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you so much for inviting me to this this evening. I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, we're super happy to have you. Um, yeah, so uh, Andrea is a lady with many experiences, but I will, I will offer you a brief introduction to her. Okay. So she's always had a love for nature, for animals, for human culture. She was raised in Tennessee, and she first fell in love with skeletons as an undergraduate at Middle Tennessee State University. Eventually, she got her PhD at the University of Oregon in anthropology, studying comparative anatomy among primates, including humans. Um, she recently completed a postdoctoral fellowship. fellowship. Uh, I have not been drinking, shockingly. Um, fellowship at the Smithsonian Institute. Oh my goodness, it's going to be one of those. National Museum of Natural History. Where it. she directed <laughs> a large scale survey studying the differences between wild and captive born monkeys and apes. She currently lives in Washington, D.C., where she enjoys debating philosophy with her partner Wesley, snuggling with their cat Jerry, and playing the ukulele. So I hope you appreciate the little ditty that I put at the beginning of this with the, the little. I appreciated it. I appreciated it. It's not often that one's put to music. So 
you know, <laughs> in general, it's an awesome situation. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I wanted to start off uh, by asking you about your path into anthropology, because it's not quite as linear as that description might sound. No, it certainly wasn't. Um, I was mostly a theater kid in middle school and high school. Um, that was, I loved art, I loved literature, music, fine art, still do. Um, but it wasn't until really college that I started thinking seriously of myself as a scientist. And first I started thinking of myself as a scientist from a perspective of being a sociologist. Um, so that's what my undergrad degree is in, sociology. Um, and I got exposed to a little bit of cultural anthropology, a little bit of archeology span in those uh, years, but it was the course forensic anthropology, which I'm sure most people are you know, familiar with that field if they know one branch of anthropology. Um, it's the forensic, so it's the crime stuff. And you know, the crime stuff was cool at the time I thought it was, but I fell in love with human anatomy, like the skeleton, what is going on? All of the soft tissue bits that I am still learning um, and don't get to work with as often as I'd like. Um, anatomy just really blew my mind. And so it had me ask a lot of questions about, you know, how I had been thinking about human culture um, human behavior, how that came to bear upon the body, um, which is a large focus of my work, despite what we're talking about today, although certainly themes, um, but also evolutionary biology, just sort of, you know, how do humans fit into a larger order of the natural world? How do body plans in general change throughout time and space? These are just topics that I fell in love with, so I went to graduate school. Eventually, you know, there were like years of life in between there when I did other things. Um, but yeah, and then I've just now completed uh, my first postdoctoral position at the National Museum of Natural History. It's a tongue twister. Um, but yeah, so that I wrapped up like last month. So it's exciting. New opportunities abound um, soon, we hope. <laughs> yes, let's be positive. Yes, absolutely. Uh... So we were having a chat a little bit earlier today, and I know you have some pet peeves around portrayals of anthropologists in popular media. And so I wanted you to tell us about the ones that bother you the most and why. So this is a chance for you to set the record straight. Okay, okay. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Um, and you know, when I talk to the public, like I often get questions like this because of course, like ways that our jobs are portrayed in the media are gonna inform what people think I do for a living. So, um, you know, top of the list is probably Indiana Jones. Um, I'm not an archeologist, first of all, but even archeologists aren't like Indiana Jones. Um, there's a whole lot wrong with, with what he's doing. Um, you know, uh, his behavior, his lack of observation, <laughs> repeatability, um, I don't know, lots of issues. Um, but the one I probably get the most because I study Bones is actually the show Bones, um, which the showrunner, the person who wrote the books, Kathy Reichs, who kind of started the whole show, um, indeed has the same training that I do as a physical anthropologist. But I don't own a gun. Um, I certainly have never been issued a gun by the federal government. And mostly I don't do crime, you know? And, and here's the thing, even though like, that portrayal is, I guess, relative to the popular media versions, like the closest to me. I would also say that they're so inaccurate so often that anyone who's interested in more than just what a television show can provide, they're actually doing a disservice in many ways by not even showing the right skeletons or the right species or the right body parts at certain times which seems like a seriously missed opportunity um, from my perspective. And then last one I'm gonna plug, even though this one actually breaks my heart more than irritates me, um, but it's this recent Wonder Woman. Um, it was filmed in, in uh, the museum. I was there while that was happening. It was, you know, an exciting um, thing. And to know that she was an anthropologist you know, it just, it made me proud and it made me think that perhaps there would be a whole generation of young girls who would also want to be anthropologists because maybe, I don't know, maybe that superhero trope could work for women instead of only working for men for once, you know? Um, but again, I feel like there was a missed opportunity for some accuracy. So um, I don't know, uh, definitely 
Uh, hi, Laura. Bye, Laura. <laughs> um, definitely some moments out there. I don't know. And, you know, evolutionary biology, I think when people think about that as a field, they may think about humans. But it's like, right, I could do what I'm doing and talk about any kind of mammal or any kind of species. And indeed, most evolutionary biologists do. They're not yeah. talking about humans, monkeys, and apes. But that's where that intersection kind of happens in my field, biological anthropology. But it also kind of says something about the road that I've traveled, right? Sort of the social science side and then sort of the anatomy side. It makes sense that I come to um, some organisms that really uh, have both uh, interesting evolutionary stories and um, complicated social histories and existences. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so yeah, I hope people will kind of take that away with them. <laughs> Great, great. There's a lot to learn tonight, guys. So, uh, you know, pick your no favorite. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there, there will, will not be a, be a quiz afterwards. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, I'll stop messing with people. Um, but for, before we get to your presentation, I want to let the audience know this is not going to be the usual seminar style gig with questions at the end. Um, Andrea has kindly given us full permission to stop her if we need clarification at any point. So what I'm going to do is keep an eye on the Q&A and lend you my vocal cords to get qu said questions answered. Um, but since we probably won't get through all of them, we'll have some that we uh, will go through once she's done with her slides. So everything sound good? Sounds good to me. All righty, good. Um, so like all scientists, Andrea has a pretty specific niche and that's where we're heading next. So in the description of her talk, she men mentions a bone called the Balbellum and the, the chances are you've never heard of it before. She was absolutely right, at least in my case. And with that, I will say over to you, Andrea. Cool. Uh, okay, I think I'm gonna go to the slide sharing situation now. Okay, okay. We're on it. <laughs> All right. Can everybody, ooh, can everybody see that showing? Okay. Yeah, um, well, I'm not surprised you hadn't heard of it. I uh, had been studying osteology about 10 years before I heard of it. And I gotta tell you, I was a little mad. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> as a person who thinks of herself as being um, sexually informed and biologically informed um, and anatomically informed, I was um, surprised. And so that surprise manifested in a few forms. So I want to kind of take you to how I got to that point. And then we'll walk through some things that I learned in my journey to understand more. So fresh knowledge here. Um, and then we're gonna go into some applications of like how I used it in research. So there should be lots to talk about. So here we go. So the first thing I wanna say is that a lot of what I'm talking about tonight happened during my postdoctoral fellowship at the Smithsonian, at the Natural History Museum. But I no longer work there. And just to be super clear, everything that is in this talk is me, my opinion, my experiences, and my observations. I in no way represent the Smithsonian. Excellent. Now I can say anything I want. <laughs> uh, all right, so you've perhaps been here before. I certainly hope that you have, and if you haven't, um, I hope you get to go soon. It is closed because of the pandemic, but it will reopen and it looks from the outside like this. It's got a gold dome, it's on the National Mall. It's a very beautiful building and it's pretty awesome on the inside too. If you have been inside, then perhaps you've met Henry, uh, one of our fabled uh, taxidermic models that is inside of the museum. Um, and perhaps you've been in an exhibit like the Hall of Mammals pictured down here. Um, this is pretty typical. This is the kind of forward stage public part of what we do in the museum. But it's not everything that the museum does. So let's go backstage for a second. A lot of the backstage looks like this. So I know it's a little blurry, but picture a whole bunch of shelves with a whole bunch of jars and boxes and racks holding body parts and whole bodies of 
every organism that we have been able to document and collect. This museum is a global leader. So it has a huge collection relative to other natural history museums, um, except for, of course, other kind of grandiose um, museums have a particular history. We'll get into that if you'd like. Um, but they have a lot of stuff. Mammals collection alone has about three quarters of a million, three quarters of a million uh, individuals, right? So each one of those has a certain number of body parts that gets um, sorted in various ways so that researchers like me can study them. So these backstage areas, they exist inside the main building where the museum is on the mall. But there are museum support centers, like for natural history, for example, the museum support center where these bottom two photos are taken. Um, think about four Home Depots, maybe, you know, like they're warehouses. It's a huge amount. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into this. But okay, so in the main museum, there's a bunch of bones. And the one picture that I'm in there in my early days of this, I'm very excited to be able to go backstage. Um, I'm looking at these cabinets and we are about to do some skeletal biology because that's what I do. So just for those of us who aren't skeletal biologists, let's do a super quick review, shall we? The skeleton. Bones are what compose the skeleton in all vertebrate mammals vertebrate animals, excuse me. Bone is a tissue type, like muscles or nerves. Closely related tissue types are cartilages that cover the ends of your bones, and they're also what babies are made of before they're made of bone. So cartilage is kind of like the thing that bone grows along. So cartilage and bone are closely related. And then also teeth. Uh, you've probably heard of teeth before. Um, they're not exactly bones. We don't have time to get into the evolutionary piece, but because they're hard and they do a lot of the same stuff, they often get lumped in with the skeletal kids. The skeleton provides every animal that has one support. The reason that you're not a puddle of water on the ground is because of your skeleton, yay. Protection. The reason that in many ways your guts aren't falling out through the hole in the bottom of your pelvis um, are because of muscles holding it in and the pelvis itself is really that we were circa here. <laughs> Something like that, it'll do. Great. Great, so support, like I was saying, right, this is why we're not a puddle of goo, um, support. Protection, so it's keeping our guts from falling out of various holes in our body, but it's also stopping things like, you know, uh, uh, balls flying at us, you know, our ribs are protecting our lungs and our hearts. Um, our pelvis is protecting various vital organs. So there's protection being offered. Oh, the skull, there's a great example, protecting your brain from things flying at it. Uh, movement, so, you would have a hard time moving without a skeleton. Uh, again, that puddle of goo problem. Um, but, you know, there are lots of different ways to sort of move around. And so skeletons tell us a lot about how animals move just by looking at their bones. There's also blood cell production and mineral fat storage and regulation. Yay, bones are cool. Okay, so an evolutionary skeletal biologist then, like me, is going to study how the shapes reflect function. So like I was just kind of saying with movement, these different skeletons that you're seeing here, there's two quadrupedal on four feet monkeys pictured and a semi-bipedal, although that, that's an orangutan, so they're not bipedal too often, but just to kind of show you some differences in shapes for how they stand and move. How the shapes and the function change over time and how they vary between species. Okay, so these are the kind of ways that I'm thinking about things when I'm looking at bones, because those are the kinds of questions that I'm preparing to ask. And this is part of a grand tradition. Meet Grover and Clyde. Grover's the human, Clyde is the Irish wolfhound. They were really good friends. And we know this because Dr. Grover Krantz was a beloved physical anthropologist and he was above all a teacher. So when he died, he donated his body to science. <gasps> cool, huh? <laughs> Clyde's too. And uh, this exhibit is actually on the floor in the Natural History Museum in the Curious Exhibit on display right now. So you can go see this for yourself. Um, Dr. Krantz wanted it to be something that we could all appreciate. And it is a really great piece because you see two animals who are roughly the same size as each other, who also have a relationship. Um, 
but you can also in sort of my comparative anatomy eye see some interesting things, right? So look at the shape of their heads. One of them has a really big brain or the other one has a really big mouth. And that says things about what kind of stuff they do <laughs> during the day. Um, they have different shaped feet and hands, although they do have similarly linked limbs, interestingly, and their pelvis. You know approximately where the pelvis is, the hips. Um, so you can see them both there. Now, you may have already noticed that uh, Clyde there has some sort of little thing. It's like there's a metal pole and then there's a jut of orange that's sticking off and that indeed is Clyde's baculum. So the baculum, unlike most bones in the skeleton, is not connected to any other bone. Fun fact. Um, there's only one other bone that matches that situation and it's in the throat. It's the hyoid bone and it is surrounded by Cartilage, cartilage and various cartilaginous structures. So you see some variation between whether the hyoid is made of bone or cartilage. And it turns out that there's something very similar happening in the baculum. Now, when I first saw this, oh, by the way, I want to just go ahead and say this. Um, this is not an erection or anything. Clyde is not like, they're not doing this to try to be provocative. That is actually where the bone sits in the body. It's sitting inside the body because other fun fact, humans are kind of weird in the sense that their penis is outside of their body all the time. Uh, most mammals have their penis tucked inside of their body and only extrude it if there's a medical concern or to use it for penetration. We said we were going to be talking about some words. There's some words for you. We're going to have some more. <laughs> All right. So you can imagine my surprise when I'm going through sort of the cabinets, right? As I showed you, like I do. And I came across this. Now, this is a really up close, close view of a bunch of bacula. Okay. And in this case, they are sea otter bacula. And I'm actually taking this picture for a friend of mine because I was trying to encourage her to do a project with me. She said, yes, we're gonna talk about it. Um, because one of the things that you, that you can see in this picture is, okay, you can see the approximate size of the bone that I've got between my fingers, right? It's maybe about as long as my thumb, but much thinner. But see the bone that's right behind the tag that I'm holding is much larger, right? Like it's easily bigger than one of my fingers. And these belong to the same species. Um, so we had questions because they were all labeled male, but we were kind of unsure. There are some interesting mysteries afoot. And before we get to those, I think we're going to stop, take a breath, and get really ready to talk about sex. Uh, because we're about to talk about sex and a little less bones for a minute. Um, because as I said, the skeleton is a supportive and protective and movement oriented set of tissues in the body. But what it also does is reflect then a lot of what an animal is doing with its time. But when we start to talk about sex, um, we're not necessarily talking about just the anatomy pieces anymore. There's a lot of things that go into this, um, including that it's an emotionally charged subject. That makes it hard to observe it accurately outside of things like anatomy. But we need to do that because if we don't understand the behavior, then it's hard to understand the function. So let's talk about some of these reasons why sex is a little tricky to study. Even when people seem open, it's an emotionally charged subject. And there's probably not no, anyone you know who doesn't have opinions and they're very personal about their body, their experience, and their experiences with people that they care about or may not care about. Uh, all of that's intensely private. And as a scientist, it's kind of hard to get to what we would call an objective truth about sexual behavior because it's hard to observe it in the wild. <laughs> it's also difficult, even if you can do so, um, to not go through an, objectiv an objectivity lens. You know, as scientists, we want to be objective. But there is an awful lot of judgment and shame around sex um, historically done to certain populations um, in this country because of, you know, some puritanical views that have been with us 
since the beginning because of a predominantly male view that casts sex in a certain light, a heteronormative view that casts like sex um, as specifically between males and females. And none of these things are necessarily true beyond nature, um, excuse me, are, these things are also issues beyond humans is what I meant to say. It's also just darn uncomfortable, you know, even if you are kind of open, like you don't kind of know what other people are thinking or what they expect. Um, and it can be tricky then to be able to see sexual behavior accurately. It's also just tough to measure, just in general. Okay, so let's say that these people volunteered for us to be watching what we're watching and this picture counts as a observation. Um, these could be two lovers in bliss. They could be two strangers where one's about to fall in the water. Um, she could be intoxicated and in need of assistance and this is not, um, you know, and this is a predatory or almost assaulting situation. The truth is, I don't know, it's just a, a picture. And this is the problem with all observation is that it does not capture the deep complexity that we are always talking about when we're talking about sex. There's also vulnerable populations, right? So folks in institutions like the military or kids, uh, places where as a scientist, um, I would love to have data, but good news, we care about ethics and science. And so we don't just take advantage of folks that are vulnerable. Um, but that also means that you're limited to things like adult volunteers, which are a self-selecting group, and that can be tricky. <sighs> There's also a lot of pain that can be associated with sex. And if you aren't aware of that or dealing with that pretty forwardly when you talk about these topics, then again, even trying to be objective, trying to even watch something and understand what you're watching in terms of sexual behavior or what you're understanding in terms of someone's self-report data needs to be understood within a larger context um, and a lot of sensitivity. It's difficult to study because it's hard to report. Sex is complicated. <laughs> And it goes along with everything from lifelong marriages to, you know, folks who may indeed be open, but are their clients. Nobody wants to sit in front of a group of scientists um, or institutional review board and try to explain this stuff. So before we even talk about, you know, why certain kinds of science might be dismissed, sex research in general is up against all of these problems. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the balbella of a chipmunk or actual sexual interactions between humans, you're gonna run into very similar problems with being able to have these conversations and be taken seriously. Um, yeah, it's true sauce. So let's move away from humans, all right? And let's move into non-humans, but we're gonna keep a lot of this kind of stuff in mind. So remember, behavior and anatomy are related. Anatomy doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you understand kind of how an animal is using their body. They inform each other. So, <laughs> animal sex. You think you know what you're looking at? Do you feel like you understand what's happening? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. <laughs> Here's the anatomy, some bones that are behind what you're looking at. So this is a selection of bacula of different shapes and sizes. See, some folks think that penises uh, penetrate and that they're rather cylindrical. And that's probably because most of the ones you see are, but that's not true across all animals. And so there are lots of strategies that involve sexual behavior and the anatomy reflects that. Neat, huh? So, in studying animal sex, there are, of course, opportunities for comparison. Here's a monkey looking at a cell phone. Here's a monkey masturbating. Monkeys, uh, like apes, share a lot of traits with humans, and we can use these to understand ways that we are different and ways that we are similar. There are of course challenges. So here's an example. You think you know what you're looking at? These are all females. These are drawings and an actual photograph of a species of macaque. And um, in both cases, what they're doing has much more to do with social dominance and establishing sort of um, 
a various level of bonding, right? Like they're investigating each other, they're bonding with each other. It's the monkey equivalent of you and I having a conversation. It's not necessarily uh, sexual, uh, certainly not in the reproductive sense and not like that lady we just saw masturbating a few minutes ago. <laughs> that was sex. Uh, I'm gonna take a sip of my water. Everybody holding together okay? Are we, uh... great, I'll just leave it here for a moment. <laughs> you really do get to um, have some fun photographs and some fun conversations in this field. Speaking of, I think it's about time. Comparative sexual anatomy. Let's get out the elephants in the room. The clitoris and the penis. These are a human pair. The clitoris is A and the penis is B. So this is an example of the organ itself. In these models, there is no bone. Humans do not have a bacula or a balbellum. We don't quite know why, although there are theories, but this is what the organ looks like in totality. Now, if these look weird to you, it's because a lot of these parts are inside the body, particularly for the clitoris. And I have an illustration that I'll display that a little bit better. But for right now, what I want you to see is how similar they are. That's the glands, that's the head, the part that you've probably seen before. And certainly the glands of the penis, uh, excuse me, the glands of the clitoris is what exists under the hood. So that is external anatomy. This is the corpus cavernosum. So the corpus cavernosum is a tissue type that actually absorbs blood really, really well. That's how one gets an erection misnomered a boner, by the way, because there is, <laughs> thank you, because <laughs> there's no I bone. always wondered about that. Right? Is that where it comes uh, from? Okay, well, I don't know, but probably. Okay, so let me just break it down a little bit. So in something like a dog, Clyde, remember Clyde? Okay, when Clyde gets an erection, he's got a small amount of erectile tissue at the base of his baculum, and that expands and then pushes the baculum out. So the erection is constant in that sense. Like he doesn't get erect and not get erect. It's just that the erection is always inside of his body unless he decides to stick it out. Humans and other great apes have penises that are always outside of their body and do not have a bone, which means that they are getting erect by filling with blood. Two different ways to achieve the same thing. Why? I don't know, and <laughs> I'm not sure how many people do, but a hypothesis that's out there, I think, is that it's connected to some of the same reasons why the clitoris is with us. Sex and sexual bonding among humans, apes, and monkeys too, as a group, primates is actually very, very important. They are deeply social animals and they have socio-emotional bonds with each other. Being able to erect your own penis with a mood, um, having more control over that erection may be a reflection of the fact that um, men have more socio-emotional control over their erections and aren't just being driven by whatever instinct is supposed to be um, or a hormonal cue, although that could happen, but that basically there's more nuance to the system. And I think that is a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, but we both have them. Clitorises have a corpus cavernosum as well. Lady boners are as real as male boners are. It's just that most of it's happening inside of the body. Uh, yep, that's true fact. And those there are the crura. Those are sort of the ends, the tapering offs of these tissues, but they're also the anchor points. They're holding this structure in deep into the pelvis so that it can't go anywhere. The clitoris in mammals that have a bone contains the balbellum. There's our bone. Uh, and the penis contains a baculum. So there are reasons even though their functions are a little different, and we're gonna talk about it, to see the penis and the clitoris as two versions of a very similar organ, okay? Now, it, they're both parts of larger complexes and we know there are differences and yes, those matter, but you're with me? Yeah, so I right. have a question. Oh, yes, let's so see. I I love lo knowing like the, the Latin and Greek origins of words. So what does balbellum mean? 
Do you know? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. And I don't even know when it was named. Um, okay. Because as we can discuss, but we can certainly say now, there is a serious dearth of information. Um, you know, look up any body part you want to, skin, liver, eyes, ears, any bony part, you will find oodles of literature, maybe not about every species that has this thing, but a lot of them, and certainly about humans. Um, because the balbellum itself isn't a human piece, and then you add on top of it, you know, all these other things, um, there's just very little research being done. But it doesn't mean the name isn't out there. Somebody in our audience may have even Googled it by now and knows what balbellum <laughs> Well, we know what the bellum part means. So I know my husband David is a Spanish speaker, and he said it means war. It so wall bellum means war, as in fighting. War. Yes. Bellum means war. Yeah. So I'm I'm assuming that the etymology is a bit more complicated than. That. <laughs> well, now I'm intrigued. <laughs> Come on, Pete. Somebody been... look it up and stick it in the chat. Yeah. Yes, please do. Thank you for contributing to the conversation because I would love to learn <laughs> something new about the Balbellum. That would be great. Um, yeah, because I don't know baculum either, and I and they're not exactly mirror words. I mean people go back and forth about whether or not they're comparative organs. And I can understand why, but when you take out other things like the urethra um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and the connection to obviously the urethra, well, maybe not obviously, the urethra conducts both urine and semen. And there's a valve that kind of switches over depending on which one is happening. Um, but the clitoris is separated in humans. So the urethra is between the vagina and the clitoris, but they're not tracked together in the exact same way in humans. Um, there's certainly variation across the animal world. Are we ready to talk about walruses and squirrels? Oh yeah. Sweet. Okay. So I would love to be able to show you some of these actual bones and uh, I can't. So we're going to have to do with some of these pictures and that'll just be okay. What I want you to notice is that I have a walrus and a squirrel pictured here, and they're both mammals, but other than that, they don't have a lot in common, except that they also both have baculum and balbellum. Um, what I want you to see is that the walrus one is like 60 centimeters, right? So you know how big a walrus is. That's still, that's still good sized, right? That's a good sized baculum. The balbellum of the exact same species is comparatively there and it's T90, right, right? And now you might think, okay, well, right, like the penis looks bigger, our clitoris is bigger, this makes sense. Okay, check out the squirrel though and look at the scale. So there's a male on the top and there's a female on the bottom. They're about uh, half the size. So the other one is what, maybe seven or eight mils, uh, millimeters and the other one's five, maybe six. They also look an awful lot alike. And at that size range, I can promise there's variation between groups. So here's an example that squirrels have a balbellum and a baculum that look very similar. Curious, right? Because squirrels still have penetrative sex. So penises go inside vaginas, clitorises don't go inside of anything. So they don't, even though they share function, they don't have the same penetrative function at least. So to see them sharing the same shape means that already we've got another skeletal mystery. How is the shape departed from the function? And why is that only true in some animals, but perhaps not all of them? That walrus is using that uh, baseball bat sized baculum for exactly what you think he is. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> so we have yeah. some responses from people. Laura and Caroline <laughs> both found out the, um, the balbellum is Latin for gem or jewel. Well, <laughs> there you go. That's a lot better than war. Yeah, gem no or jewel. That's lovely, y'all. Thank you so much. Lovely. And baculum yeah. means stick or staff. They're very stick descriptive. Or yeah. staff. So, yeah, very descriptive. And certainly you would think then that the baculum that are famous are going to be these giant baseball bat sized ones because, I mean, oh my gosh, right? Uh, but the truth is that even, you know, going to like the baculum side of things, there's so much weirdness wrapped up in studying sex that, you know, folks collect these like giant things as, you know, something about penis size perhaps. And then uh, we have no real good data 
unlike who all even has these things, y'all. Okay. I could have warned you, but I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Here it is. Here it is in situ, as we say. So that means that I'm showing you uh, an image that is a drawing depicting the clitoris as it sits inside the body. So in silhouette there are the hood of the clitoris with the major and minor labia sort of silhouetted around. So you can see the vaginal opening, the urethral opening, see it's a little lower down, but you can also see that it's only that tiny little head, the glands clitoris that is sticking out of the body most of the time, and that the corpus cavernosum goes all the way back. I would like to just point out that although numbers, because sex, tough to measure. It's hard to actually get a number like, how big is the average human penis? You probably think you have an answer to that, but check their methodology, check their citations, because remember all the stuff we were talking about, like either you're going to have people telling you what the answer is, and do you trust that information? Or you're going to have to figure out some way to like get everybody to drop their pants and be measured, and who volunteers for that? And you can't make them do it, so it's tricky um, <laughs> being able to get real numbers. Well, the clitoris is harder to get numbers on the ways that it is different, um, the ways that it is diverse among humans and among other animals, but we think that it, on average, they're like eight inches long, eight inches, <laughs> uh, right? And that they're going all the way deep into the into the back. So there is so much more science, y'all, still to be out here. We know very little about these guys, but let's just run down what we know for sure. The clitoris is an organ. It has all the hallmarks of a specialized tissue type. It has because all organs have function, a function. The only known function is orgasm. As everybody here, I hope is aware, you don't need to have orgasm to reproduce. You should, but you don't have to. Those are decoupled systems. So there is no reproductive function to the clitoris. All mammals have clitorises or clitorides if you prefer. Um, (laughs) Most mammals, humans are an exception, most mammals have the os clitoris, the balbellum, the gem or jewel of the skeleton, that's right. Uh, Clitorises and penises are not always easily distinguishable, uh, the squirrel example, but there are more. And as I've already said, they are used for non-reproductive purposes, but do not mistake that just because it's not reproductive doesn't mean it's not functional. We've already covered a few of them. Orgasm is a function and it's a rather spectacular one. But there's also this social bonding notion. Um, As we saw the ladies who were uh, writing each other and investigating each other's nether regions and things, and by ladies I mean monkeys, female monkeys, Um, (laughs) we um, were investigating sort of some of the things that are being used Sexual pleasure, yes, but bonding as well. And there could be more. The truth is we haven't done the studies to actually figure that out. Continuing with things we do know, here are some pictures of some really fuzzy mammals that we know for sure have bacula and balbella. Uh, So yeah, oh yeah, yeah. (laughs) So kind of going over that list, we've got some rodents at the top middle, ground squirrel and a marmot. So all rodents we think um, have the bacula balbellum. We, bats are also a group that most people attribute to having a back of the babella, carnivores, which include cats, bears, foxes, and some primates. So like these monkeys, we've got a spider monkey pictured on top and some female baboons on the bottom there. Um, I have in my notes, and they're actually a little tricky for me to see right now, but I just wanna point out that there was a study that came out in about 2017 that tried to look at the entire mammal lineage to try to figure out, okay, like, well, if only these folks have it and these folks don't have it, like, where did the break come? You know, like, did where did we lose it? And their estimate that was, <laughs> that we had lost and gained this, these particular bones, and yes, we're assuming that they moved together, that baculum and, bellum, baculum and balbellum are together, there, present in the species, or they are not. We're not breaking them apart, okay? Um, but they think, their study showed that we had lost 
and regained this bone nine or 10 times uh, throughout the lineages that they looked at. So uh, probably a few, yeah, I mean, mammals are ish 65 million so years old um so interesting and what that means right so just to like go back to our skeleton everybody has ribs okay everybody has vertebra everybody has a skull everybody has arms and legs now the shapes they're a little different some are bigger longer they change based on function but what doesn't change is whether or not the damn bone is there like it's there but not in these guys and i find that fascinating right fascinating i hope you do too so we have a question from karen and karen. maybe this will come up later but why don't we have these bones anymore i have no idea i I think that that is a question that we don't know. I mean, and by we, I mean science. Like, there is shockingly little research. <laughs> I mean, people that study anatomy and human anatomy at that their whole lives haven't heard of this bone. So asking then or answering a question like, why did we evolve without it? It is, uh, I could only offer conjecture, kind of like I did for the guys. I mean, there's marginally more uh, data done about penises, but the truth is it's all done in this like not objective framework. You know, we learned a lot about reflexivity and objectivity in the last 25, 30, 45, 50 years of science in lots of different ways. and even though there's been some trickle down, I mean, I'm giving this talk, I'm talking about these things, you know, it's, there's change and certainly there are more clitoris papers published every day. Uh, I hope there's more than the last time I looked, um, but it's still, you know, it's something that's changing now. So hopefully Karen, you'll have an answer soon and you should ask other scientists that question as well. Cause I'd love to see their reaction, you know, like unrelated, just biologists in general, just ask them. <laughs> see if they know. Okay. We've already covered a lot of this, but let's have some fun examples. So that's a hyena, and that's a female hyena, the spotted one, the colored one. Uh, and that thing that's dangling is her clitoris. Now I'll tell you something fun about hyenas and their clitorises. So much like our clitoris has unpaired from our urethra, their clitoris has actually paired with their vagina. They give birth through that. They give birth Ooh. through it. I know. I know. Ooh, that sounds like it must hurt. I, I, I mean, I not that regular birth doesn't, but no, yeah. sure. I, well, I, I wouldn't mean, know, right? but you know. <laughs> right? And even though I don't have a picture of it, you should also know this fun fact. Pigs have their clitoris inside their vagina. Huh. You think about that the next time you think about, you know, intelligent design. Uh, because, <laughs> um, because sex is complicated. And when you have all of these different organs and all of these different functions competing in the same place, um, you're gonna have some different uh, morphs and different pressures that different species are experiencing. Now there's been a good amount of work um, on the cheetah clitoris is more than many species, mostly because, oh my gosh, look, right? Um, and so what folks, sometimes it gets called a pseudo penis. Uh, often the explanation for why this is, is because uh, basically a fancy version of sword play, more or less. I mean, that they're like, you know, showing off how awesome and like big they are just like that walrus, only they're females. And so in the social dominance hierarchy, this works and is accepted. Um, it's a hypothesis and I don't know if I believe it, but again, you know, more research gets there. All right, now the ladies in black and white over here. Um, so these are bonobos being depicted and they are doing something called Gigi rubbing, which is genital genital rubbing. Um, you can describe this as homosexual behavior. I think that that is all right. Although it's really difficult to kind of put a larger anthropometric, anthropomorphic, that's the right word, anthropomorphic lens on that. Because like I said, um, 
primates bond through things that look like sexual behavior to us, but apes and monkeys do that all the time and they're just being friends with each other. It doesn't necessarily mean all the things that sex means to us, at least we don't think it does. And it's really hard to ask. Um, so we're sort of stuck in this position. But what we know is that particularly in bonobos, this stuff happens all the time, all the time. And so one can imagine that um, having a function like orgasm and being able to bond with that with another member of your species matters and that it might create um, familial or partnership bonds that offer protection and support um, to a larger community, whether or not you're reproductive. And that's certainly the case uh, with great apes. So close relative, fun fact. All right. Oh, so question? Things. First Please. of all, a technical thing for the audience. Sorry, we had the chat switch, essentially switch so you could only talk to us. Now you should be able to talk to each other. Go nuts. Um, and we also have a question from Erin, which is, do the hyena have a balbellum? And if so, does the bone change during birth? As far as I know, they don't. They don't have a balbellum. And I think that's interesting because I think that their clitoris has been, I mean, okay, here's my conjecture hypothesis. Um, that they're, because their clitoris has been co-opted for such a unique function, which is being shared with the birth canal, um, that a bony structure would be another limiting factor. Um, but as far as I know, no, they don't have a balbellum. Very good. Oh, we got through our two things, right? Okay. We yeah. did, yes. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, good. Because uh, we're getting to, this is a fun slide. So what don't we know about the clitoris and the balbellum? Well, you might have been asking some of these questions and I'm not going to read them to you. We're not gonna go through these one by one, but I'm gonna guess that you might be asking some of these questions or versions of them. These are questions I have and questions that with my knowledge and my ability to do research, I have not found answers to. And there are some studies that begin to point at some of them, um, but compared to what we know about lungs, no, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> there's a lot uh, left to learn. So science continues, right, it must. And by people who um, maybe bring a slightly different perspective um, so that we could potentially be learning new things because we have a lot of freaking whys um, going on here. And I think that we have a little bit of a responsibility to figure out what that is. Certainly we have the tools to do it. So the fact that we haven't done it, um, you know, I can only think of one excuse for that. Um, and that's the patriarchy and it's sad. <laughs> you know, whether it was direct or indirect, um, we need to know more um, because we're curious because we own these things, because creatures that we love and affect own these things, and because evolution is cool and we should understand it. It helps us understand how we can continue to survive together on this planet and how we've done so in the past. Um, it's a little thing. It's, it's not all just about orgasm, guys. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's about research. So let's do it just a little <laughs> bit. Remember when I showed you uh, <laughs> that box of bacula? Well, that became a poster that my collaborator, Carrie, presented at the American Society for Mammologists in 2019. We're not gonna go over this in detail, but I wanted you to just kind of see it because we indeed found that they're like two different size bacula and we couldn't find an explanation for it. It wasn't age, it wasn't mislabeled females, it wasn't um, really young guys like who suddenly is like bacular bone doubles in size during their lifetime. Uh, but we've got two groups who otherwise compared to like the size of their skulls and all we could tell from the rest of their body, we didn't have an explanation for why these two morphs were different. Um, so there's another mystery um, that all we could do was sort of report it and say, we should understand more about sea otter sex because it seems to be really complicated too. And wait, let me just say this. Before you go Google sea otter sex, be warned. Okay, I'm serious. You don't always know what you're looking at. Remember that, anthropomorphizing, it's a big thing, but I will also say sea otter uh, sex is triggering. It's triggering. 
because it's violent. Ooh. And okay. Okay. So just be aware um, before you go watch it. I know cute fuzzies in the Pixar movie. Yes. <laughs> they are also complex social creatures with a sex life that we don't begin to understand. Um, so there's your bit of sea otter knowledge dropped for the evening. So we have another question. Let's. And this is from Adriana. And so actually, I kind of know the answer to the first part, which is, have there been any studies about the amount of innovation across different species? At least I know somebody who's studying that. Um, yes. uh, different species is clitor clitorises. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, could the pig's clitoris be less sensitive than the human one? So being inside the vagina then wouldn't be problematic or I guess problematic is a wrong word, but. Uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, so yes, in some ways there have been. So where I learned about the pig clitoris, and I'm going to plug this book at the end, but there's a wonderful chapter about it in Mary Roach's book, Bonk, uh, which is well-researched, but it's a great narrative story too, that kind of explains why we know this about pigs. And uh, spoiler alert, it's because we reproduct, we make pigs, it's an industry, um, we produce them. And so knowing what makes um, female pigs most likely to be impregnated includes making them comfortable. So like I said before, although the clitoris doesn't exactly have a connection to the to reproduction, there are a lot of folks who work in reproductive health who think, uh, human and otherwise, who think that the more comfortable and safe you can make a female, the more likely she is to have a healthy pregnancy. And so if you can, um, if that's safe or um, an option to pleasure her, that there is a correlation. Now, is that correlation real? Has that been tested vigorously? No, but it's a nice idea. And certainly I don't think there's probably too much harm in it. But you hit on something really important because pigs don't bond in the same kind of way. Yes, they're social, but you can certainly tell from like the fact that they have hooves on the ends of all of their hands and feet and not hands that are made for touching things that they don't bond and touch the same way that humans and primates do. So having their clitoris inside of their vagina um, may in regular pig sex or in industry versions of it um, be leading to orgasm. Although, according to the industry standard, again, in Mary Roach's book, Bonk, uh, it takes about three minutes for a human to get a female pig to orgasm, whereas average pig copulation time is circa 30, 45 seconds, if I'm remembering yeah. correctly. I, the things you learn <laughs> when you study evolutionary biology. Um, yeah, so... Have there been comparisons? I, I, sort of. I would not say that there's like a big compendium of like all the different ways that all of these animals have differences, but there are stories like the one I just relayed to you that are sort of giving us some ideas of how the clitoris is being, you know, it may be on the outside, like a joke that it would be nice for it to be inside the vagina, but seriously, the GG rubbing thing, it's very possible that our uh, clitoris is on the outside of our body for the same reason that our penis is, is because we're a species that likes rubbing our junk together. And you can't do that if it's inside the body. Fair point. Cool. <laughs> okay, a little bit more research. We're almost there, y'all. I have no idea how long we've been doing this, but we're almost there. Great. Okay. So these are two of my uh, intern friends. They used to be my interns. That's Ryan and Julia. They helped me on this project. And this project actually got kind of stopped right in the right in the middle, right before we were about to climax. Uh, the pandemic stopped us from being able to do this research. So I'm going to just report a little bit of an idea about how I'm trying to get to some of the answers for the questions I have, the questions that you have. So like I said in the beginning, the museum has a bunch of bodies and for primates and specifically, uh, not humans, but all non-human primates, there's like 10,000 plus individuals, give or take. They look like this. Not so much anymore, but in life, this is absolutely what they look like. We got gibbons and then squirrel monkey in the middle and then howl monkey on the end. Okay, 10,000 primates, including some of these. 
with my two interns here, uh, we surveyed primate skins. Okay, so remember when I told you that inside all the cabinets there are all these body parts? Well, it's not just bones, even though that is the majority, but there are other body parts too. There are soft tissue organs that are preserved, uh, various kinds, brains and penises, believe it or not. Um, but there's also skins. So, okay, a taxidermied individual is one that's been like stuffed. It's a real animal, but it was stuffed to resemble how it would look in life. A study skin is a lot more like a bearskin rug, only made for studying instead of walking on. So what it means is that they've basically taken the skin and preserved it. So it often has little bony bits stuck in the ends, right? Okay, when I found that cabinet earlier and I was like, oh my gosh, here's a bunch of bacula. That cabinet had more than just that pile of a 159 sea otter bacula in it. It actually had closer to 1500 bacula that were from all kinds of mammals. And I don't have numbers to report on all of it, but I looked for Balbella and I found less than 10. Oh, wow. So, right, so even in a place where they're being collected, um, they're not there. So what we thought, me and the interns were, now wait a minute, sometimes if you're looking for other little bones, like little fingertip bones, they get stuck in the ends of these skins because to cut them out would mean to destroy the skin and the bones just aren't that valuable, they leave them in. So we thought, what if we go look at the primate skins and look and see if they still have their balbellum or their baculum tucked in there? Because remember, it's a bone that's not connected to the rest of the skeleton. So they could have cut off the skin and left that bony element and not even known that it was still there. So, we managed to get more than 2,400 skins Ooh. surveyed before the pandemic. Of those, 979 had pubic regions. Basically, they had the right part we were looking for. And of those, we think that there were at least 335 bones tucked inside of that. Now, now again, I want you, I want to draw a picture for you. We've got um, some skins and there are three of us who with gloves on are palpating the, as in using our primate hands to touch and manipulate a skin that is kind of a supple leather stage that has bones stuck in it. And we're feeling genitals to try to decide if that if a bone is what's in here because we can't destroy the skin. We could x-ray them, but we didn't because of the pandemic. <laughs> but we got to 335 that have a bony structure and of those 135 are females. There's a chance, y'all. And these three species that I pictured, these are all ones that we have pretty surely positively identified as those who have a bacula or a balbellum, and that we in fact may even have these balbella in our collections already and just not know it, which would be awesome because that means we don't have to go out and collect new ones or, you know, ask people to show us theirs because that's harder. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is harder. So yeah, um, this research is continuing to, on, to go on. And I told Ryan and Julia, they may even be watching, I guess, uh, you know, that I was doing this talk and maybe we should pick it up again. So, you know, um, there's always hope for the future, but certainly I hope that others do. And if somebody wants to go after those 135 females in the museum, talk to me and I'll send you my data sheet. <laughs> We're on the frontiers of clitoral research, people. And these are some things we need. <laughs> we need an expansion of anatomical knowledge. Like seriously, we need to know like who has them, what they look like, and some real basics about how the bones shapes vary and change over time. We need an increase of female-centered, non-heteronormative research perspectives. And we need a revival of sexual selection theorizing from Darwin to now. And this one is actually the most hopeful space. There has been a lot of work from the animal behavioralists, primatologists in my um, case, and leading, I think, a larger field of, of animal behavior. That because of the behavior of things like the bonobos and the macaques, there have been a lot of behavior-based theorizing about how sex is working from an evolutionary perspective, as in 
different sexes are investing in sex in a different way. It means bonding, it means reproduction. When is reproduction happening? How and why? There are a lot of really great work um, relative to female choice out there. Sort of how many of these factors are really guiding why sex is what it is, particularly in our close relatives and in the mammal world, that there's a lot of these sort of factors. It's, humans aren't the only ones that have a complicated sex life, not by a long shot. Um, so there's, there's really great stuff out there and, and more coming. Huh. So some takeaways. Well, the clitoris themselves and the Balbella are valuable research specimens. If you're into natural history museums and you think it's cool that a place like that exists, my bad, uh, then I hope that you recognize that these are a part of it too. Um, folks that go in to measure femurs and vertebra and skulls and teeth and all kinds of things, they do it all year round when the pandemic's not happening. And um, those specimens are available for research to the public public museum, everybody. These are actually our collections of Balbella and clitorises. So yes, there needs to be more research that's integrating anatomy, that's integrating molecules. Oh my gosh, we did not talk about genes at all. We did not talk about hormones at all. Um, those are in no way my specialties, um, but there's, I'm sure, a lot of people who would have a lot of really interesting things to say relative to some of these perspectives, and I hope that there is more of it. We need more public engagement, like this freaking event, because this is how we get the word out. This is how I explain to folks, you know? Um, I didn't do my dissertation on this. And honestly, I think it probably would have hurt my career if I tried. Like, that's serious. And it's unfortunate because it is the only bone that no one's ever heard of, right? And it like, <laughs> maybe it doesn't exist in us, but it exists in our close relatives and we don't even know why it doesn't exist in us and it's bullshit. Um, so I'm really depending on the public to, you know, be involved in science and hold other scientists to account, me and others, um, you know, why aren't you studying these things? Why don't we know more? Uh, be demanding, that's what you absolutely should do. All right, I said I was gonna plug those books. Here are a few of my favorites. Bonk is a nice overview. It gives you lots of fun facts um, about science and sex. Becoming Cliterate is more of a owner's manual. It's uh, focused on um, human relationships and sex, but it's certainly aimed for, yes, orgasm equality. Who doesn't want that? The Case of the Female Orgasm Bias in the Science of Evolution is a fantastic book. Uh, it really goes where I only kind of talked about a little bit and into the theory, the best ideas we have about why the female orgasm has been treated as irrelevant and what that has cost us in terms of understanding sex and sexual reproduction across the board. Learn, you guys, learn and do it. Do it for science and enjoy yourselves. <laughs> well, that was a lot. It was a lot. Um, I told you there was a lot of knowledge. Hopefully yeah. everybody else clapping in the background too. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to say with the word bonk. So in the UK, it very commonly means to have sex. Um, and in the US, when I heard the term bonking during a marathon I was just completely bowled over so it means hitting the wall and for me I was like damn how do these people have the energy like 20 <laughs> miles into a marathon but yeah I you learn things from both ends of the scale I guess you do you do um yeah I don't know that I'd ever thought of bonk in this uh I didn't know that it was a word for doing it um until Mary Roach's book so yeah. There we go. I know, right? The things that you learn. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as Andrea mentioned, um, we do hold these events, and especially the online ones, we do for free. So if you feel like you want to support us, because Zoom, glitchy or not, is not free, um, please feel free to go to our website, con uh, tasteofscience.com, <laughs> and donate us some money. We will take your money. Um, <laughs> And we will love to answer more questions. So please keep adding them to the Q&A. 
Uh, we're also going to have a mini interlude now. This is from my friend and recovering anthropologist herself, Kyle Marion. Uh, she's now a science communicator, comedian, and event producer herself, and occasionally likes to dress up as a talking clitoris. So, um, this is only going to take up a couple of minutes of your time, but we hope you enjoy. So, I'm going to attack the screen sharing. Let's see how this goes. some clitoral action. <laughs> yeah, girl. Get it, Tina. <laughs> oh, oh, we're taking socks off now, Dan? Yeah. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> A little bit of grinding. I like being included in the set. <laughs> oh, now focus on me, Dan. Boobies? Yeah, girls! <laughs> Get some! <laughs> Isn't it funny how you two aren't even sexual organs and you get all the action? <laughs> no, I'm happy for you. <laughs> oh, okay, my turn. Yeah, bring his hand down to me, Tina. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Damn. <laughs> Jesus, it's not like I'm not made up of over 8,000 nerve endings here. Be gentle. <laughs> Tina, Tina, we talked about this before. <laughs> Me orgasm is two orgasms, so say something. <laughs> you, you know what? Bring Dan's face to me, I'll take care of it. Daniel, <laughs> I need a warm, hmm. oh, or you can just keep smelling that alphabet on me, that's fine too. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what, that's it? <laughs> <laughs> really? Millions of years of evolution to give you an actual pleasure bullseye from my girl Tina, and you're just gonna, you're just gonna up and ignore me? Your tongue got tired, Dan. <laughs> Guess who's tired of being unappreciated? <laughs> oh, okay. Daddy boy, get back for some more. Uh, uh, what? What? Did you just dig? gender studies to be liars, Tina. <laughs> Thank you. 
All righty, friends. Hope you enjoyed that little bit of comic relief. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the, the Q&A for you, Andrea. Um, and so our friend Karen is back and she would like to know what could be the purpose of the Balbellum? Mm. Um, so going back to our sort of basics about what the skeleton does, <clears throat> your best bets are gonna be support or protection or movement. Now, based on the organ that we're talking about, movement is probably not its main function, although there might be some of that, especially if um, a female is able to extrude her uh, clitoris, just like we were saying Clyde could do with his penis. Um, oh wait, I lost my train of thought. What was her question again? <laughs> I had another answer to it. Uh, what could be the purpose of it? Oh, um, oh okay, right. So protection, I think is actually a fairly good one um, because as we've kind of talked about, there are a lot of really important wires, um, if you will, or canals, um, parts that we need to live like uh, a functional urethra and a functional vagina in a longer survival sense. Um, so, you know, there may be support that's being offered interiorly to sort of the base of the organ. Um, protection and, and also certainly, <laughs> If you can also go with, if males can use their erections to uh, affect social situations, right? So they can use it to do dominance displays with each other or to signal sexual awareness to females. And then it's very possible that females can do the exact same thing. And we just aren't watching for it or aren't looking for it in the same way. Although there certainly are some animals like the hyena that may indeed be doing this exact thing. Um, so you may also have sort of this remnant piece um, that is there to offer support uh, for being able to sort of push the organ out. So yeah. Uh, All righty. <laughs> And then Mary would like to know, why is a raccoon baculum curved? Ooh, that's a fun question. Uh, fun fact about raccoons and their bacula. Um, they're one of the best ways to know how old a raccoon is. Ooh. So yeah, it's the, so we've actually done some baculum uh, research in raccoons and aging them. Um, telling how old an animal is can be kind of tricky, but the skeleton has several places where those are really informative and apparently the bacula. So I believe actually that the curvature, um, there's a couple of things going on. So it's a little bit of a elongated S curve. So one of the ends of the curve is because it's sticking inside the body. So remember sort of that picture of Clive. So his ba baculum was particularly straight, but some of them sort of sit sort of at an angle under the belly and sort of inside. So part of that curve is just to kind of get it out of the body. This is a weird, <laughs> example of what I'm trying to show, um, but that's why the curve. And then the other end of the curve, the other end of the S, is actually supporting the glands. So uh, there was a slide early on where I was like, look at all these crazy bacula and all the different pictures. Most of the architecture of the bones that's happening on the end is to support the glands of the penis. And the glands of the penis varies quite a bit on what it looks like and um, you know, whether it's even like kind of a solid mushroom head thing, like sort of what we're used to or something more complex. Um, yeah. So there's why <laughs> raccoon. Also, they get curvier as they get older. I was going to throw oh. that. So there's some answers. <laughs> more fun facts. Oh, okay. So people are putting questions in the chat. That's okay. I can keep up with this. Um, so Jackie would like to know, do these always exist or not exist together? I, um, oh, 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 <laughs> like sorry, the, the chat's that. jumping up and down. Yeah. So in other words, are there animals where the balbella exists, but not the baculum or vice versa? Not that we're aware of, not that we're aware of, which I should actually say. So here's another kind of theory that might explain why the bones exist uh, at all, even if they don't seem to have a particular function. So the easiest kind of example to this is nipples, okay? So <laughs> nipples in the males don't have much of a function, right? I mean, they're kind of sensitive and under certain conditions, males can lactate, fun fact. Um, but for the most part, they do not. And so often from a evolutionary developmental perspective, 
what we think is that because the pressure is so strong on the females to make sure that you have working nipples so that you can lactate, so that you can feed your young, males basically are getting nipples because there isn't actually that much difference between a male and a female. Like we have so much in common and it's these hormone baths at different times that kind of push us down one trajectory or another. But some of these basic core parts of our body we share. So even if the pressure is the selective pressure or the evolutionary pressure is on only one sex, the other may tag along. So that could also be an explanation for the balbella is that if there's pressure enough on the bacula, and you can understand why that might be, if that's the only way that they can use their penis penetratively, they have to be able to do that to make babies, um, then the bacula may be kind of the female version of male nipples. It is a um, piece that goes along with it, which of course only explains the bone and not the function of the clitoris. But thanks for asking, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I think we're starting to wrap up with the questions. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom for us, Andrea? Um, it's always helpful to know more. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is a serious dearth of information. And I think, I think in so many cases, you know, we assume that like scientists know, it's just the rest of us that don't. I mean, I certainly thought that. I certainly thought when I started in this field that we knew all things about all animals and it was just me who didn't. Um, that's not true. It's just not. And so, you know, I feel like you don't need a fucking PhD. You need to be curious, you know, you need um, to just keep asking questions and keep kind of finding the answers and tuning into an event like this tells me that you're already that kind of person. So good on you because we need you, um, you know, it's, it's how we move forward um, as a society. And, and others being able to hold scientists to account. They are humans and they're not all um, as objective as they think they'd like to be. In fact, none of us are. Uh, you know, we have to um, work that reflexivity, work that criticism. And there are tools inside the scientific process that are designed to allow us to do that. And they're still working. So yeah, thanks for being a part of it just in general. <laughs> Sweet. And we, we thank you so much for um, talking with us today. This has been super cool. Um, and before we disappear, I would like to give a big shout out to Gary Somashika, who is our volunteer, who are, is the architect of this whole event. Everybody say thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Also, Laura, who's hiding in the background. Um, she is one of our moderators and one of our um, lovely team members as well. And yeah, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's been super fun. It's been a pleasure having you. And um, so for those of you who've already seen like our event passport thing, for those of you who attended, you'll get a little stamp. So remember the more stamps you get, the bigger the prize is. Um, check out the rest of our program at tasteofscience.org. And yeah, that's it from us. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.